Inflection point ventures. Very good. Do I get some? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know them already. <laughs> Alright, a very good evening and a warm, warm welcome to all the members for our session today on evaluation of early stage startup. We are so glad you all could make tonight and join us in large numbers. I am Saloni Sham and I am honored to be your MC for tonight. A few housekeeping rules before we start our session. Ensure that your cell phones are on silent mode. Questions will be taken at the end of the session. By uh, one by one by raising your hand. To kickstart the program, I would like to welcome our ICI Singapore Chapter Chairman, C.A. Ranke Subramaniam, to give his welcome speech. Please. Thank you, Saloni. Good evening. Uh, good evening, all of you. Good evening to our members. <coughs> welcome to our guests. Uh, a very warm welcome to IPB founders, Ansel and Matesh. Thank you for coming uh, from India, uh, from Gurgaon and uh, Mumbai. So, firstly, let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Our management committee member and past chairman Rajiv was responsible to bring them here. So, we must acknowledge Rajiv's contribution as well for the evening's event. I think. Uh, all of you are connected on our, we're all connected on the WhatsApp Connect groups and the first topic of the evening is great news for the chapter. We've been awarded the second best overseas chapter, second prize. I think this is uh, uh, an honor for the members, for the volunteers, for the management committee, a lot of the past leaders. So I really want to you know, thank everyone for being fabulous members and a lot of the people we've been meeting one-on-one -on -one are feeling very energized about the chapter. In fact, uh, in the last few months, if you see the number of new members who are coming in, right? And if you read some of the profiles, it's so inspiring, isn't it? It's just so amazing. The amount of the COVID members, existing, new, and I really love it if we can you know, give a warm welcome to the new members who are just joined us. Many of them are present this evening, but a warm welcome uh, to, to all of them, okay? Um, now, before I go forward, um, can I just request a, a spontaneous, impromptu sort of a feedback on the chapter award? Anyone has of mind reactions? What did you feel good about? Anything we can do differently? A quick one. Keep up the good work. See is, sorry? Keep up the good work. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's Next great. year number one. <laughs> ah, sorry. Next year again number one. Next year again number one. <laughs> Take them. Can I pass the mic to our vice chairperson, Somna? To give it to other people to talk yes, about. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think I will just say one thing. This was possible um, with the dedicated efforts of all our volunteers. Uh, that goes without saying. And the biggest of uh, biggest of all is the, the dynamic leadership of Ramki. I think he has done a tremendous job. I have worked with many chairmen in the past, including many sitting in this room. Uh, and his style of leadership is very different. He gives the ownership to people. He let the people run the show, which has uh, enabled all the volunteers to take the front stage and run uh, with everything. So thank you for that. I was very surprised that it was second prize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well said, well said. You spoke my heart. <laughs> Apurva, please. Apurva is a gentleman who spends a long philosophical books every day. Let's make him speak. Pawan Sahib. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is compulsory. People don't speak. I just want to say. I'm past chairman. I think it was uh, fantastic. Uh, we did that immediately after COVID. Uh, so, uh, definitely a very good effort by all. Congrats. Thank you. Manoj? Yeah, congratulations. Uh, the first order. I think it was it was great to see that it's the, it's the second prize, but we were expecting the first. I think we, <laughs> we will get it next year. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sake. Uh, like I said, I echo, echo some of the thoughts that the question is why are we not first? And I think so we require an investigation for that. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true voice, you all for that. Huh? <laughs> but um, no, thank you so much. I mean, it feels really good and uh, it's visible when we meet each other in person. And a lot of the members are not here today. I do want to thank all of them. As all of us know, we've been quite successful in hosting events every month. If you look at the quality of speakers, starting from Mr. Vinod Rai, the ex control Auditor General, to our President and Vice President of ICAI, Mr. Dr. Devashish Mitra, uh, Mr. Aniket Talati, who's going to take over as the youngest chairperson, I think in February, this month. He's all of 34 years old. Oh. Yeah, 34, 35 years old. So he's going to be our new chairperson in New Delhi. And, and, and of course, after that, we've had speakers like Saurabh Mukherjee, we've had uh, Chetan Dalal, we had Arim House expert Saket. So it's been a melting pot of uh, knowledge series, events, and today we are honored to have uh, reputed speakers, and I can sense the energy in the room, and a lot of people have come and said hello to them, so I'm sure they're very popular, knowledgeable, and waiting to listen and learn. So once again, uh, Vinay and Nitesh, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, let's have a nice evening and post that in a networking dinner. Thank you. Back to Sanoni. Thank you so much. So as you all know by now, the speakers for tonight are two stalwarts, CA Vinay Pansal and CA Mitesh Shah from India, who have been part of some of the mega startups like Bharat Pay, Geo IQ, Milk Basket, Ola, Book My Show, among many others, and now are the co-founders of Inflection Point Ventures, IPD, one of the leading venture funds from India. CA Vinay is a qualified chartered accountant and a turnaround expert with over 20 years of experience in Fortune 50 companies, private equity and startups. In his last role, he served as a senior advisor at TPG Global and before that he was the CFO and CIO at Wildcraft India. Before starting his journey with startups and private equity over the last decade, he has held leadership roles at GE and Hindustan Unilever. Vinay is also an avid sports enthusiast with interest in badminton, swimming and long distance running. C. E. Mitesh has started his career at Mandana Industries Limited in 2001 and handled projects like the company's IPO and exclusive global licensing deal with Salman Khan's Being Human brand. He later joined Ola as CFO in 2013 and played a crucial role in its success. In 2016, he took a similar role at Book My Show and helped drive the company's growth. With his experience in the startup world, Mitesh co-founded IPV in 2018 to mentor founders across early stage startups with smart capital. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the stage to the experts for the day. Let us give them a warm round of applause. Oh yeah, I In the meantime, he switches it on. I, I just wanted to say thank you to Ramki uh, and of course uh, to Somnath as well. You've been very kind uh, and very, very, uh, you know, uh, I think you're, uh, you, you, you as a host, were wonderful. So, so thanks a lot for uh, allowing us to hear. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, I was reflecting on the question of why not first, right? We were expecting to be first, we were surprised to be second, etc. I'll, I'll give you an example here. So in TPG, when I was there, we used to run an annual contest of, you know, picking the public market stocks. Every year we meet at the annual conference and the next annual conference, we will see who, who became the first, who had the highest IRR. So for four years I was there, I was never the first. Uh, but I was always second or third. You know, I would pick stocks. Some people will take bets, and you know, some stocks will just outperform. Uh, but I would not take the outperformer stocks. But what was different was that when you looked at the four years together, those four stocks that I picked were by far, far, far above uh, anybody else over four years, because every year was a different winner. But I was always in top two or three. It makes you far stronger. What matters is over a period of time yeah. and not just one year, right? So, it's okay that you're doing 
just one more question. We were not asked our opinion on this achievement or not. But are you guys raising? <laughs> <laughs> are you guys raising? That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> we will after this question. <laughs> <laughs> our hopes are raised. Yeah. I, I hope the mic is yeah, it's working. It's working. Just check it from my Take this one. I think the, the other one. I just I thought I just want to learn a few things as well about this group. Uh, and the second thing um, I, I I would want to do is one more thing before I get into my session is you know I was told that questions at the end. Can I reverse that? Um, I will want to if if you if you allow something. Uh, okay. Uh, learn uh, about this group. Uh, how many are finance professionals? All. I know the few are not. So I just want to raise of hands. So it gives me a sense. So about 50, 60 percent. Yeah. Okay, majority. got it. Understood. So good majority. Uh, what do we think is the average age of the group? Uh, is it is it 20? Is it 30? Is it 40 or 50? 20. 40. 40. Okay. What is the retirement age in Singapore? 62. No retirement age? Fine. All right. Sure. So I, I learned something about this group, so I know how to kind of uh, ask or deliver a few things. So I have a question to ask, right? A lot of finance guys here. So let's say a finance guy today puts in about 100,000 Singapore dollars at the age of 40, right? What is the, what is the FD interest rate here? Deposits? Right now it's very volatile. Average? Three to four. Three to four percent? All right. Four percent, let's say. Usually it is zero point four five. Okay. Okay, fine, fine. It's a banking community, I guess, right? All right. So let's say let's say you still get a six percent somewhere. I, I'm sure people will be happy, right? So let's say you were to invest this hundred thousand dollars today at let's say about six percent, and by the time you retire what would that number be, assuming compounding works? Any, any hands up? $360,000. Any other? Real value or nominal? It is compounding after 20 years. How much will you get back if you were compounding at 6% per annum? Forget the inflation no, no All right, we have good CAs here. The number, the number is right. But I have one more question. You can use the calculator again. If this was compounding at 26%, at your retirement, what would this number be? 16 million. One, question, one is 100K is, one person is saying 16 million. Yeah, 16 million. Any other numbers? Yeah, I think more or less people are happy with this number. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's say anywhere around 12 to 14 million. Which number do you want? Right? So that's the difference in investing in, let's say, venture capital funds uh, or early stage funds. This is an average return, 26% that funds in the US, Europe, UK make, India is a bit higher. India is about 30%. And you see the difference that it makes, right? Our minds are not built to calculate geometric progression. Our minds are built to do arithmetic progression, right? But smart CAs, of course, are trained, and therefore, you know, people can still come up with these numbers. The difference is huge. Just by adding 20% to an annualized IRR, you have moved from a $360,000 to almost about 12, 14, 15 million dollars. You know, that is the impact of a small change of percentage growth over periods of time, yeah? So I think that's, that was one thing I wanted to kind of clear on as we start this journey for today. Any questions so far? All right, what now let me... What if I was to say 1500 USD? Would you be happy? Okay, perfect. Uh, manageable. Manageable. But you don't get this kind of return in all the startups. It can be a few of them, but few of them also fail. Where you lose all the money. We are talking about portfolio, portfolio. right? This, this is, is a portfolio end. return. Individual startups have had thousands and one hundred thousand percent returns also, 
right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. What we're talking about is a portfolio return, which is you have invested in, let's say, an average of about 15 deals, 15 to 20 deals. This is what you should expect. Yeah. All right. So let me, uh, you know, go against the advice of Saloni. Any questions you would want to get answered during the session, I would want to write them out here. So we make sure that we cover those. Otherwise, we can get started. Uh, but we would like the group to be engaged. What is the history that we are saying that 26% return will continue for next 20 years? Sure. Good question. You mean multiple for valuation of that particular? Sect sector level multiples. Sector level multiple valuation. Okay. Understood? How do you pick up companies to invest? What's your benchmark? Benchmark? Benchmark as in? So, you said 26 for the return, for the return comparison. If you compare the benchmark, like even Warren Buffet has not been able to do that. So, I'm trying to understand what's your benchmark. So, Warren Buffet uh, has compounded at around 19.6%, right? But that 19.6% started very late. Before that, he was compounding far higher, uh, right? So, so, it's a good question. What's the benchmark and why do we? People don't achieve this 26%. I think that's the important question. So now why we don't achieve 26%? I think that's a more important question than the benchmark. Fair enough. Yes, please. The question is why 26%? Why 26%? This is historic actual. It's a historic actual. For us, if I was to tell you the number, it's 50% plus over the last five years. And what is the guarantee that you will earn on it? Absolutely. <laughs> Bang on that I have a question for you. Yes. The guarantee question. Uh, do you know what is the benchmark return for Sensex in India? Let's say 12 to 13 percent. 99 percent of the people don't make that return. On the same Sensex. Same Mr. Market is available to everybody. Uh, right? But we'll come to the guarantee part for sure. I think it's linked to why people don't make this 26 percent. Yeah. You had a. I want to know about the legalities around this. Um, legalities, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so what resources do you rely on for the multiples? Resources for the multiple? You mean the databases and the uh, databases and the historic data? Basically, yeah. I think about methodology to arrive at a particular level. Got it. Ah, absolutely, absolutely. So early stage, early stage valuations, basically. Okay, got it. What is the downside risk? Hmm. Downside risk, absolutely. That comes with guarantee, right? Downside risk, absolutely. Some of these questions are linked. How do you time your exit? Time your exit. I think that's the most important question. Yes, please. At the back. Minimum investment? Minimum investment. We said 1,500 years. But yeah, please. Noted? Portfolio. portfolio, strength of the portfolio. Yeah. yeah. Would you be covering the evaluation within the evaluation and the management and uh, you know the skills of the people? Absolutely, sir. We'll cover that. We'll cover that because that's very very critical. Maybe a linked question, but you know there are a number of startups that are coming up. How do you differentiate as to which will you know sustain for a longer period of time or just you know just a boosted return in the Long term. Sure. So, in the presence of too much dry powder, how do uh, startups select which venture capital they want to get investment? Dry powder, selecting an investor basically. It's a good question. What is the normal break even point? Break even point in what sense? Between how many years you can end the profit? Holding period. Okay. Any charges, fixed charges? Charges? Sure. I think Vinay, you can postpone it to bonus by Sorry. Who decides to exit? The portfolio manager or individual can exit themselves? Okay. Individually can also, yeah, based on the decision. Everybody different appetite. Exit decision? Downside risk is also good. No, the downside risk I think we already. Okay, sure. Sure. Yes, please. Um, just a 
is there a way to define the success formula to raise from that? You are asking this from a founder's perspective? Uh, from a VC perspective. Like, is there a formula to raise money from LPs? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. So, for a VC to raise money, is there any verified formula uh, oh. to raise good money from uh, VC? LP? Achha, LP to VC. Yeah. Understood. Understood. Yes. Please. What kind of mix do you have between institutional investors and retail investors? Sure. Retail versus institutional. Yeah, invest, investor categories. Investor base, basically. Yeah. The composition of the investor. Sure. So, if, if I have understanding of some industry, uh, how far can I get involved in the business? Active, 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 active investing. Active. Yeah. Anything else? Geographical coverage. Of Geographical coverage. Awesome. Yeah, how about mark to mark revolution? Mark to market. ESG considerations in early stage ESG? Yes. What are downstream tie-ups you have to enabling? Enabling exits. Awesome. I think largely, yeah. largely done. Uh, so let's see if we can, if I have to postpone my flight tomorrow. Um, related to what uh, Nikhil said, yeah. there's tons of experience sitting in this room. Here. Yes. There's a big ecosystem out there. How can we all contribute? I mean, not monetarily, but how can you know, yeah. like advice or analysis? Or I think that's the active I investing part. Analysis. Yeah, that's the active investing part. Cool. I think I have a tough job to do, but still, nevertheless, let's get uh, started. And I'll try to cover uh, uh, most of these, uh, you know, as we as we go through. If we don't, then at the end of the session, we'll we'll cover. All of us heard this multiple times, known this multiple times. All of us will agree, a common agreeing ground, that's what we're starting with, right? 90 to 95% to 99% fail, right? Anybody invested in startups earlier? Yeah. Wow, that's a big crowd. Uh, what is your percentage past success rate? Ongoing. Ongoing, okay, fine. Results yet to come out, right? Long-term perspective, fair enough, fair enough. Right, so the beauty of a large failure rate Right? Where is more data? In successes or failures? Failures. Failures, right? So any, any smart individual, any smart professional, the whole core of science is minimize failures. Because you have data why it failed. You keep fixing that, and you become far more successful as you go along. So coming second is not a problem. But figuring out why you were second is what you need to work to. Right? Every time. Because you will compete, you will learn, and you will improve. Right? So that's exactly what we did. We, before starting IPV, we looked at last 300 years of failure data. We used reports, which were externally available also. And that was a mine for us, saying, OK, why do startups fail? Right? Now, if you can minimize these failures, your success rate goes up. Right? That's what we do with our kids change their habits. What do we do? Do we put them new good habits or we try to replace old habits with new habits, right? We keep killing old habits. As we grow above 40, which this group is, most of you are leaving some foods, leaving some old habits behind, right? That's how you're improving and growing, right? That's exactly what happens here. So what we learned is that there were three big reasons why startups failed. One was the business was bad inherently. It was not making money. It was not required by the customers. Or it was, model was not right. Second big reason is the people who are running it are not capable enough. Right? You asked the right question, sir, saying, will you be covering the quality of people, the management, et cetera, et cetera. There will be great businesses run by bad, bad people, or sometimes not highly integrated or honest people. Those businesses do well, but their investors never do well. And therefore, this community being investors and founders, we need great, honest, integrity-driven founders for investors to trust them and to make their own return while growing the founders. Right? Third was the ability not having enough cash to run the business. But to today's world, if founders are great, business is great, cash will come. Right? So that's, that's the premise of three principles that we use. And anybody can use these principles. Very easy to remember. Invest in great businesses, 
run by great people available at reasonable valuations. Because if this, if this is not right, still you investors will not make money. Right? And investors may not invest again, the ecosystem gets hurt. So far, basic three principles, clear. Right? Let's move to the next page and see what, what do we mean by great businesses. Great businesses are those where their products are required, demanded, addictive, repeat usage by the customer. That's a great product. Customers want to pay for it. And the price is such that the company makes money out of it. It can grow and scale large. Think about iPhone. Think about iPad. Think about watches. They have even made, even the earphones, which was such a dead product, into a great product. People love it. People want it. They can't live without it. Right? Facebook. You're addictive. Right? In Instagram. WhatsApp. These are great products that, can, that your customers love. They will be willing to pay also. WhatsApp doesn't charge today, but it charges the businesses like us uh, really heavily, right? So we are willing to pay for it, right? Basics. One of the other pieces is the competition around uh, in, the, uh, in the same market that you're playing. Take airline industry. Very highly technical industry. Ideally, to our common sense, should be making a lot of money. But no airline, most airline stocks never made money for the investors globally. Similarly, if you look at hospital industry, especially in India, right, doesn't make money. It should. It's a need of everybody. Everybody needs hospital and, and medical services, and every, anybody will pay any number of amount to pay, but still hospitals don't make money. Right? Where is the answer? I think we have to understand that even though it's a great, great product, great need, customers willing to pay, still don't make money. Why? Right? Pricing and costing issues. Sometimes we don't price the product right. A lot of finance guys here, one simple question. If you were to decrease the price of a product by 1%, by what percentage will the absolute net margin go down? So if you were making 100 rupees of absolute net margin, right? by what percentage that will go down? Simple marginal costing. You cut the price by 1%, that 1% will flow right down to the P&L because variable cost is not changing, your fixed cost is not changing. Typically, you make 10% margin. If that 10% is 100, that 10 will go to 9%. Now, 100 will become 90. So your margin will go down by 10%. It's a 10x factor right there. People who fail to understand the difference or the impact of pricing and costing, huge impact. So 100 other factors one needs to look at when you look at the quality of a business. Then you look at the quality of founders and many other things. But one thing we must be clear, a simple, simple framework to look at how to invest in startups. All of you can learn it, master it, apply it. Nothing here is something that we are going to keep hidden. Right? Simple rule from Warren Buffet is when a management with the reputation for brilliance tackles a business model with the reputation of bad economics, it is the reputation of the business that stays. Have you ever thought about that? Take any sector. Every sector has a fixed gross margin. If you are in rice, rice will have a certain gross margin across the industry. You take shipping, certain gross margin across the industry. Airline, certain gross margins across the in industry. So if you're in a bad industry, nobody can save. If you apply the most best of the brains. So it's important to get the right industry first and then apply the best of the brains to get the best of the business results out, right? And we see that many times. Smart guys will hire for the wrong product, doesn't go anywhere, right? Fourth piece is very critical. We call it the four aces framework, which is you take the feedback from the customers, from the vendors, from the employees, etc. Is there a need of the product? Will this work? Etc. Etc. Second is you analyze what you've got. Ask, analyze. Which means this is a problem. Can this be solved? Now when you give a problem to a subject matter expert, he can usually solve it. But if you give a business to a subject matter expert and say will it work? He will generally say no it can't work because it has so many problems. This, that's called a bias, an expert's bias, right? We need to be very careful, right? I, I, when I was investing behind Milk Basket, 
I asked the milk veteran in the country, 30 years in milk business, I said, will this business work? Should I invest? He said, no, 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 don't invest in milk basket. This business will not go anywhere. I have seen milk for 30 years. That business was doing about 5 lakh rupees a month that time. Today, it does about 150 crores, all in four years, a month. Right? That was the confirmation bias or the expertise bias. We need to apply SMEs to solving a problem, give them a sharp problem, they'll solve. It's like surgeons. Right? So very important who you ask and analyze. Third is anticipate, which means, OK, where can it go? Because what is it is today? The price is baked in. The valuation is baked in. But where it can go is where your valuations will go. Or the returns to you will go. Right? And then finally you act. This is the most difficult part of the story. We act when we should not act. And we don't act when we should act. Right? Take a recent example. How many of us invested in the stock market in 2020 April? It was down by half. Two hands went up. How many invested in the stock market in 2021? So many hands will go up. One year, the market doubled and still people are investing. That is what causes your 26% not to come. Same market is available to everybody. Same price is available to everybody in as much quantity you want to buy or sell. The key is controlling your actions, your own psychology. So you should be able to invest when the market is selling. You should be able to buy. Sorry, you should be able to buy when the market is selling. And you should be able to sell when the market wants to buy. That's exactly what we did at IPV. In 2020, we invested behind Blue Smart Cabs. We invested behind OTP. We invested behind Milk Basket. We invested behind Torch. We invested behind Fable. All of them are today 30x and plus returns, two years. But nobody else was cutting checks that time. So that mind, that ability to have strong conviction when everybody is saying sell, fire sale, is when the word comes to life. And then sit, shanti se. When do you sell? 2021. 2021, we actually exited about 25 stocks. Returns, 10x, 20x, 30x, 40x. I think two weeks back, we gave a 30x return on one of those deals two years back. Right? So Bharat Pay was an 80x. Another three, four deals, I don't know if I can name, but 30x, 40x, 50x. Right? So that's, that's the key. Uh, in managing investments, can you take the right decision at the right time? When to enter and when to exit? Follow your brain and not your heart. Heart is followed by the masses. So everybody is buying, price is already up. You are also buying because everybody else is buying, a wrong call. You are selling because everybody else is selling, a wrong call. Both in equity markets, both in real estate markets, as well as in um, startup investing as well. I mean, last year my sister bought like Three houses in Canada. She lives in Canada. I just happened to talk to her and she said, I bought the third. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, interest rates are zero. You know, it's, it's free. I said, please go. And they were all possession-linked payments, which means she has to pay you know, three years later. I said, go and sell right now. If you get a premium, great. Thankfully, she didn't buy more. She didn't sell, but she didn't buy more. Today, interest rates have jumped from 1% to 5%. It's a huge amount of pain on that million dollars. right? So that's very important not to go with the flow or go with the masses, right? So how do we look at business? We look at a very simple model, Porter's Five Forces. Uh, I you know, took some courses at NCIAD as well. They taught me how to look at a blue ocean and how to look at a blue ocean shift. But a very valid model is what we look at generally in evaluating businesses. So if you go to the next page, let me just simply play a video here uh, for you guys to get a sense of uh, what we're going to talk about. I may skip a few pages today, given the time. I think I, I have 10 more minutes, Mitesh? Yeah. All right. What factors actually matter the most for startup success? First, the idea. I used to think that the idea was everything. But then over time, I came to think that maybe the team, the execution, adaptability, that mattered even more than the idea. And then I started looking at the business model. Does the company have a very clear path generating customer revenues? 
And I looked at the funding. Sometimes companies received an intense amount of funding. And then, of course, the timing. Is it early, meaning you're in advance and you have to educate the world? Is it just right, or is it too late and there's already too many competitors? So first, the top five companies, CitySearch, Cars Direct, GoTo, NetZero, Tickets.com, those all became billion dollar successes. And the five companies on the bottom, we all had high hopes for, but didn't succeed. I looked at wild successes, like Airbnb and Instagram, and Uber and YouTube and LinkedIn. The number one thing was timing. Timing accounted for 42% of the difference between success and failure. Team and execution came in second, and the idea, that actually came in third. The last two, business model and funding, made sense to me, actually. You could start out without a business model and then add one later if your customers are demanding what you're creating. And funding, if you're underfunded at first, but you're gaining traction, it's very, very easy to get intense funding. So take a wild success like Airbnb. That company came out right during the height of the recession when people really needed extra money. We started a company called Z.com. It was an online entertainment company. We were so excited about it. We raised enough money. We had a great business model. But broadband penetration was too low in 1999, 2000. It was too hard to watch video content online. And the company eventually went out of business in 2003. So what I would say in summary is execution definitely matters a lot. The idea matters a lot. But timing might matter even more. I think startups can change the world to make the world a better place. Thank you very much. And a great audience. Is the product opening a new set of customers or a new market? When the iPhone is coming out, how many people are connecting to it? When Facebook is starting in a college, how many people are connecting to it? So are you gaining a significant market share in the niche area? If you are, it's a high likelihood that when that expands, it will expand. IPV may be the largest angel network in the country today. But when you go to Singapore, we don't know. Right? When, we, when, we, when we use the same practice and principles, we'll, we, we'll see how the traction builds up. Right? So nail it, then scale it. And very important. So product is important. So what all should you check in the due diligence? We'll be leaving the secrets to you guys. You can copy it, you can photograph it, and you can use it in your own due diligences. And then you rate it. You put the scores on this. And then you can get to a combined score of how a startup is doing by the time you get to invest in it. But the decision, the last part, is critical. Many times we reach good decisions, basic models, but we, we hesitate to act. Right? That's very critical. So if we move to the next one, I have one message from Steve Jobs uh, as well. I think it's a wonderful message uh, which we should take away when looking at many startups, especially the deep tech startups. As I've always found is that You've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And I've made this mistake probably more than anybody else in this room. And I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we have tried to <clears throat> come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple, um, it started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not, not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and, and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how are we going to market that. Um, and I think that's the right path to take. SMS anymore. Right? And India started WhatsApp, you know. Yes, but now OTPs are also moving to WhatsApp. It's a matter of. And you don't initiate it, I think it's. Yeah. Are not in Singapore yet? Okay. Uh, I think when I landed yesterday, I needed to get a COVID test done. I went 
uh, so two things actually. Uh, 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 yesterday I got two things on, on WhatsApp. I don't know which one, maybe I'll, I'll not quote, I, I could be wrong. But a lot of stuff is moving towards WhatsApp as well. It's expensive as compared to SMS, but yeah, I think definitely more user friendly. Yeah. Uh, so it's just convenient. Similarly, Zoom. You know, many people use Google because it's free, but people who really value experience will go to Zoom, right? Same stuff. You need to be, you know, on, on a video call. Blackberry versus Nokia versus Apple is a great story, right? Some people stuck. So, what do you want to ask? Is the problem being solved? Effectively, is it what all factors is a better solution at? Right? What you should check in due diligence? How easy is it? Do you speak to customers? What are customers saying? Uh, what do you rate in uh, on online user interface, experience, product metrics, etc., etc.? And then of course, uh, you know you look at how is the quality versus the incumbent, how is the speed versus the incumbent, and how is the portal five versus versus the existing incumbents. Very simple. If I was to take an example, I'll not play this video, but Kunal Shah does a fantastic job here. Uh, so let's say today if you were to go and book your taxi by calling a number, scheduling a pickup from for the airport, the car coming, the anxiety, and then going to the airport. Five years back, ten years back, that's how the story was. What would you rate that experience to be on a scale of one to ten? One, ten being great. At that time it was great. That time it was great. Today? Today it's zero. Today it's zero. Grab. What will you rate? Number one to nine. That's ten. Nine. What factor is it? It's a 4x, 5x better. Yeah. Right? For any new technology, any new product to be able to compete, it has to be a factor of three or four. That's called delta four. Unless you are delta four, you won't succeed. A better grab comes tomorrow, it will not succeed. Yeah, please. So, see, most of the businesses are in fact, it's been described where you mentioned two qualities or check marks that are there. So, if I take any successful business right now, there, you take all those boxes. Correct. We are talking about Grab. We yeah. are not talking about some air taxi which will come tomorrow. Correct. Uh, we are also not taking an example of something of tomorrow. Correct. Which is there. So, therefore, to, to compare and to invest, are you suggesting that we find out what is trying to solve yeah. the problem of tomorrow, or is it that what is trying to solve the problem of today? Because sure. customers are today, right? The previous absolutely, is absolutely. So what we call that is, and I have covered that in the first step. Either you are creating a new market, or you are disrupting the existing market for the existing customers. So, so I'll let me explain the two concepts here. Uh, new market is created when you bring new types of customers. New types of products which were not available earlier. So you also create customers. You absolutely do. You absolutely do. Right? Other places you disrupt the existing market. And Ola and then Uber are a disruptor of the taxi market. Yes. Right? And a lot of us did not. Maybe I'll them. just go one step forward with it if you allow. So I don't know how many of you go to Delhi. Of course, a lot of you go to Delhi. Raise your hands. How many of you have now started using Blue Smart instead of Ola and Uber in Delhi, in Gurgaon? Right. I think this is a cab service which we funded two and a half years ago and they had all of 300 cabs which is now gone to 10,000 cabs. Now Ola and Uber were already there with 50,000 cabs each. Right? But the way these guys have disrupted in spite of being more expensive than Ola and Uber is just pure customer satisfaction. No cancellation, no surge pricing, right? always on time delivery, very clean EV vehicles and that's where they have created a path for them. So in spite of being in a market which is like a complete duopoly. So, so you can create a new market, you can disrupt an existing market. For disruption, you need a 4x, 5x better product. To create a new market, a shabby product will work. One time, but one time, yeah. To create a new market, a shabby product will work. But to disrupt, you need to be 5x better. That's the key difference in the two terms. What does that mean? So let's say tomorrow you get an air taxi in Bangalore. But it's sometimes late. And it's very expensive. Will you try? Maybe once. Yeah, if it is net saving my time. The company is paying. You try. You try, Bangalore. It's a four-hour ride. That's the Right? And even if it has some glitches, you'll live with it. Let's take a recent example. Five years back, ten years back. All of us use dial-up modem. 
we lived with all of them. Connect doesn't connect to two hundred to two hundred kbps speed doesn't. We all lived with it. Why? It was disrupting the market. Because internet was not available. We were willing to live with that. Today, will you live with a dialogue model? That was a phase. That's exactly what I'm saying. This is the difference between a disruption and a new market creation. And you need to understand where it is going. A new market is always better than disruption. Why? In disruption, you will compete with well-established, well-funded players. But do the same. Do the same thing, right? And therefore, you will have a huge amount of disruption, huge amount of red blood on the floor. In a new market, a blue ocean, as we call it, it's far easier. So new technologies, therefore, which significantly change things in a new way, are far more easier to make money on. Ola, Uber will be always difficult to make money on. Yeah. All right. So let's. Uh, so I mean, Jet Airways versus India, right? 51, 53 percent market share today. It's profitable. Right? What did they do? They said time is the key. Let's pick that up. Let's cut the time. Let's be on time. And behind that, they put a lot of infrastructure. Did you notice this is the only airline which has ramps up the aircraft? Did you notice they make you wait in the buses before they load? Right? Did you notice that the IST is not Indian standard time for them? It's Indio standard time. They announce it. Right? So they made changes to every part, just focus on one thing time and see where they went. It disrupted the market. Right? Okay. So, so again, you need to ask a lot of questions, etc. The next one is that the business model is uh, is irrelevant. Uh, right? So we all know Kodak story. We all know Xerox. We all know Nokia. Uh, many stories we failed to pivot. We failed to change with the world, and that where uh, you know. And this is where the mindset of the founders becomes very important. If the person is not willing to change, his business will not change. Right? So that, that's very critical. What are the questions do you ask? Is it the most scalable solution that you're trying to bring? Uh, do you think the business can profitably sustain for four to five years? Five to ten years. Somebody asked me a question around sustainability. Right? You need to ask that. Will this be around ten years from now? Right? If the answer is yes, it will be a good way. If the answer is no, it's a fad. You know, last year somebody came up with a audio sharing service, I forget the name, um, it was, uh, you get it to dial into some uh, uh, some meetings and some audio, some people speaking, some people hear it, right? Today it's not there, Club just house. one year later. Clubhouse. 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 Yeah. Right? How many of us think that we continue to, you know, uh, hear those audios 10 years later? We don't have the time, right? It gets scary. So yeah, so you look at a lot of these things, you look at a lot of these, we ask this question to be diligent and then you score. Okay. Last video I'll play one more from Kunal Shah. It is on the Delta 4 piece um, that we had spoken earlier. Uh, maybe a few words of uh, wisdom from him as well. This. You will also observe sometimes that the Delta 4 behavior is not just function of efficiency but also affordability. Sometimes the Delta 4, let's say flights are more efficient than trains, but nobody is moving to flights as much because they cannot afford it. But what if they can afford it? They will not use the trains anymore, right? Therefore, it is important to understand the affordability angle also over here. So, going back over here, wherever the Delta is less than 4, right, you will observe that it does not really create wealth or stay there, it sometimes even uh, retains the wealth. Sometimes what happens, however, is that people pour in more money to increase the delta, right? For example, I will start offering 30% discount on shirts to increase the delta artificially. The natural product does not have the delta, so I put more money to just artificially increase the delta, and therefore, you will see it will actually erode wealth. A lot of times, in fact, 99% of times, I have seen entrepreneurs pick up. So I think you get the sense, right? Uh, how, how better for so important pricing and value for money becomes very critical. Uh, and your unit economics therefore becomes very critical because your discount, we just heard, 1% discount, what it does, 10% discount will make you from a profitable business to an unprofitable business. Just 10%. Most of the time, the startup doesn't make any money. Correct. So how do you really have a metrics as to when it has got to make money? Yes. So what you will see is that there are various curves of maturity for any business, not just startups. 
Uh, earlier, what we need is a product market fit. Do you think customers are coming? Oh, yeah, they are coming. Then you see what can you price it at? Got the five customers, I can price it 100 rupees or 100 dollars. My cost is 50 dollars, 50 dollars I'm saving. Cross margins start to become very important. Are you making a 70% cross margin? SaaS businesses, right? Then you see, okay, my fixed costs are so much, my tech, tech cost is so much, but at this level, I'll be able to cover my tech cost. Then you start looking at the bit term. Then after a bit term, okay, my borrowing cost, my capitalization cost, my pack. And then comes a price to earnings ratio by the time you hit the IPO, right? So, IPO companies, post IPO, PE. Before IPO, a bit term. Pre-Series A, Series B level, then you look at start looking at gross margins mm -hmm. and customer matrix. At a pre-seed, seed, you start looking at you know pre-gross margin, the revenue, the number of customers, the number of products, the scalability. And then you have pre-revenue, pre-idea, the founder. <laughs> what is he coming up with, right? So every stage, your scale and the, the matrix changes to give you far better view, right? Because if you were to look at a startup with a prior price to earning, you're never going to be able to invest. Right, so hopefully that answers the maturity curve on the PNL line. And I'm explaining the PNL line because most are accountants. So they understand the right from the revenue, which is volume multiplied by price is revenue, and then you know you come down, right? So so that's how you have a time bandwidth for all these things, like within five good, good question on timing. I think somebody else also asked earlier, you know, when you should time stuff. Honestly, timing is no meaning. From when you are in the right direction, choosing direction versus timing, choose the direction. Nail it before you scale it. Don't try to go to Bangalore and Mumbai and, and Hyderabad when you are loss making in Delhi. Right? See what model works. Fix it. But, but then most, scale it. Sorry, but more, most of the startup investments in today's scenario is all on photo, right? So at least from, from our perspective. Yes. So a lot of it is formal, you know, national bankers will call you saying this guy is putting in, so you should also put in, right? But then this it training will have no meaning. Yeah. Ah, very good question, sir. <laughs> so, I Punjabi, I will I will tell तरीके स्टार्टअप वैल्यूएशन दे सारे ड्यू डिलीजन से फंडे सारे देखे जाना है पर तुसी कर नहीं पाओगे सही कहा लेना ना ना ट्रांसलेट इन इंग्लिश सो नो इट्स जस्ट टू क्रिएट सम एक्सटर्नल यू नो आई वाज जस्ट बेकिंग अ फ्यू फॉक्स आउट राइट सो द पॉइंट इज दैट यू नो ऑल द नॉलेज ऑल द आइडियाज आर देयर the ability, the will, the passion, the grit to do it is there only 1%. After that, out of that, if there are 100,000, let's say 10,000 founders, they all have the same idea, only 100 will have the grit to do it. Out of 100, only 2 or 3 will be technically qualified to do it. So out of 10,000, 2 or 3 can do it. Right? Idea, sab ke paas hai. Now, if I was to take a poll of ideas, how many of you have? This hundred people have, I've left 1,000 ideas on the board today. Next one hour. Like a name. Right or wrong? So be open with your ideas, share them through, maybe it touches a soul that wants to do it, has a capability to do it, then does it. Or get those people on your uh, table who have the ability to do it, and then who want to do it with you, it works. I mean, we are a live example. Right, me, Nitesh, Ankur, we are not childhood friends, etc., etc., right? Uh, we found a common interest, we found a common problem, we wanted to solve it together. We just came together and said, okay, we will nail it and then we will scale it. That was the whole idea. Right? So, so that, that is very difficult to find. Now, that's luck. Can you find those people who you will marry and be happy you married after, right? <laughs> so, 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 that's the point. So, the ability to do it, the capability, the technical ability, and the willingness to do it. Correct. Before you express. Correct. 
I'm saying in that particular when it's a good idea, great idea, new God. business that you're saying and not God. disrupting the market. I understand. Then, you know, it's it's a it's a trade off. I got your how, idea. How question, sir. I got your question, sir. So this book actually answers the same stuff. Saying when you should blitz scale. Which means that at a, still a certain point in time, you are running a good business, but the moment you see somebody else is going to come in your territory and understands the way, that's the time you should just go all to build scale. Simple example, Nokri, Sandeep Bichindani. He was running Nokri profitably, he was scaling well, but the moment he saw VC money starting to come into that business with others, he went out and raised Series A and then took to took, 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 took. He raised only one round. But he knew if he didn't raise that money, to scale it, he would have got time. Similarly, Uber and Ola. Once Uber showed the world how it can be done, easy to copy. So then it had to blitz scale to be able to capture the world. So, sir, you need to write timing when you want to scale, but it's important to understand how the process will work before you scale. Otherwise, that loss will multiply. Absolutely, sir. So, when you, when you scale up like that, you just go and acquire the competitors on the other regions or how is it? Multiple options are available. Uh, if it is a software product, yes, you can. But if the idea is to acquire customers, then you acquire those uh, companies who have those customers, right? Recently, a uh, Capita from Singapore acquired ESOP Direct in India, right? Because they knew ESOP Direct has the right customer set. So they acquired ESOP Direct only to acquire the customers and they put it in the new system, they're all set. Right? So, so that happens as well. So you have to evaluate how, how that works. Capita founder Lashman is also on I know, I know. That's why I took that example so that you can relate to what I'm saying, right? Uh, all right, uh, but of course the legal challenges we all spoke about, but legal challenges are a great place to find unicorns, right? If a law changes, the whole new world opens up. Earlier, I don't know if you know, pharmacy was not allowed to be delivered to homes. During COVID, that changed, made pharmacy a unicorn. It actually bought over a publicly listed company, Thyrocare. Law changed, somebody captured the opportunity. Ten years back, five years back, you could not have done it. Similarly, Dream 11, betting is illegal in the country. But the moment the High Court said this is skill-based, it suddenly became a unicorn, right? So keep a watch on how the world, the governments are changing. They will provide a huge new opportunity, and a new market opens up to, to, do, uh, to do business, right? Um, so yeah, you can ask a lot of questions. You can, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, now, the second most important part, this is a tougher one, is founders. Yeah. So you asked, yeah, founders, okay, so, like so we look at founders at least in seven ways. Each of these seven ways have ten more criteria under them. Right? For example, do you have the vision of a Steve Jobs? Can you explain the business in two lines? Can you get 100 people to join your team by your vision? I want to change the world. Or he goes to a Pepsi CEO and says, do you continue to want to sell a cola sugar water? Right? That is the power of those words and the vision and passion. Communication is critical. These guys are very passionate. They are visionary what they want to do. Whether it's Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, they, they give a vision out saying, wow, this can change, right? People will stick. Second is leadership. Can you work with stakeholders? Will people want to work with you? Will people want to continue to work with you? Can you handle investors? Can you handle employees? Can you handle customers? Can you handle vendors? Can you? And the list goes on and on for a founder. Right? So that leadership is very, very, very critical to be able to hold the glue together. Third is motivation and passion. Why is he doing it? If he's doing it for money, the moment the funding runs out, he will run. But if he's doing it for a passion, he will go great. We had Fable, for example, his father died of diabetes and he wanted to change diabetes scene in the country forever. He ran out of money multiple times, but he came back. Today, 30 years later, maybe for us. Right? Similarly, Fitso. We wanted to change fitness. I mean, uh, you know, Avinash knows uh, how it changed. Went out of money multiple times, but stuck to his passion. And therefore changed, changed the world that he wanted to do. Ability to execute, ability to work hard. It needs 18 hours a day, 7 days a week, right? Can this guy do it? If you know somebody is late for the meeting already, you ask him to send a number, he can't send the number to you. You ask him to send a presentation, he can't send a presentation to you. He's not gonna likely to be working hard to, to get your stuff done. So when we ask founders some questions on due diligence, they can't come back to us quickly, they know. 
what's happening. Uh, experimental mindset, right? This is not working, same goal, what else will work? Try. If you are not trying enough, you are stuck to your ego or not listening to founders, not listening to peers, not listening to experts, problem. You can't experiment, move on. Technical skills, right? I'm sure none of you will trust your trusted car driver to fly your airplane. Right? So if you're in the airplane industry, you need a pilot. If you're in a software industry, it's a tech product, you need somebody who can code, who understands code and engineering. Right? If you're in a medical industry, you need somebody who understands patients. So a technical capability in that field is required to be really able to go big. In, either in the founder or in the team. Uh, and then the ability to network, ability to get the right people with you, ability to go out, talk to people, inspire people, right, and, and so on and so forth. How do you handle boards, etc. Right. So you ask a lot of these questions to the founders, uh, and when they come right on it, it's a great founder. But still, the most mistakes happen on the founder quality, right? So we scored founding team on multiple parameters uh, before we even put them up for uh, you know, investing. So hopefully that answers some questions uh, around quality of founders, people, management, etc. In terms of founders' attributes, right, a lot of the stuff is available nowadays. So fake it till you make it. So how do you tell founders who are making it also in this process? Sure. Uh, so uh, when you ask the founder a deep technical question, he can't answer it. Right? We all interviews in our companies. We technical interviews. We have CAs and thumb push. Accounting revenue recognition का मुझे मतलब समझाओ और revenue recognition के लिए technical skills भी कॉर्डर then ability to hard work आपने उसने बोला आपको सर मैंने पांच बजे तक आपको report भेज दूँगा वो अगले दिन पांच बजे तक नहीं आए so you know his guy is not committed right similarly when you talk to his employees they are not talking the same vision as he is talking you know there is a disconnect in the vision and the communication right I will give you some items, I will give you some items, I will give you how to answer each of these questions, right? So yeah, in summary, we have a lot of things. We look at about 200 to 300 points. We ask these 300 questions before we actually get to say this is worth investing. And you know, Deepak Chandran is here, he co-leads a lot of deals with us in Singapore. But it's a very hard process, it's not an easy process to be able to see where are the diamonds, right? Diamonds are formed, formed under pressure, they are rare, you need uh, a Johari to find the diamond, right? Alright, so let's hand it over to, I guess, Nitesh to take it from diamonds onwards. Thanks, thanks guys. Uh, you know, before we get to the question answer, I think there are a lot of questions, but uh, we'll take a quick 10 minutes to introduce our role into this and I like when Manoj spoke about FOMO, so I think one of the biggest reasons over here that, you know, we are successful is that we we teach or we train investors not to be driven by FOMO. And that's one of the best outcome of collective investment. I think IPV success or first quote success as we'll see is primarily because the expertise of a lot of people and we don't get driven by FOMO. Uh, but before that, I think all of us will have one question in mind saying that, okay, you know, today it's such a bad time. We hear examples like Zilingo, Go Mechanic, Bharat Pay and, uh, you know, a lot of other names where uh, you know there are so many issues around governance and on top of that the economic downturn overall markets are down how do we kind of trust why do we invest into this so we went a little deeper into this and without getting into names you can just see the slide some of the best names actually were not or some of these large unicorns were created during the most ferocious of the time right so economic downturn of 70 microsoft dot com and others are greedy be greedy when others are fearful Great. So, why why such thing, right? Why downturns is something that we like. First, as an investor today, personally for me, I feel great when we speak to founders because this is the best time to actually negotiate some great valuation. Some of these founders are coming back. VCs are taking quite a long time. Gone are the days of 2020 when every founder was sitting on two different term sheets with 10 million dollar valuation each, right? And we are now saying that okay, let's make sense. If you really are here to build business, we are there to help you. Right. So, investment opportunity, great startup at decent valuation, when I spoke about investing into great founders and great ideas at decent valuation, that's one of the most important thing. Uh, late stage startups will be willing to raise survival and growth capital from angels, right? Without naming a lot of little bit late stage startups also, which are now again coming back to us and saying that if there is a bridge round possibility. Now, some of these are inherently strong, maybe they took some wrong calls in between, 
but we trust the founder, we trust the business, and this is the time to fund them again. Resilient startups, matrix focus, VC investment, focus to shift from growth to profitability. Now the questions have totally changed. One of the days we were talking about GMV and GMV multiple and all, everybody is saying, okay, revenue and revenue ke baad, profitability. So this is the mind shift which is happening and which is actually a good change because, you know, even founders have now become more responsible. When they come, they know what sort of questions they're going to get, get asked. And weeding out of subpar startups and founders from the market. So overall, if you see the total uprounds, right, in, in over a period of time, after a flat sort of a time or a or an economic recession, these are the actual data in, in US in 2007 to 2012, the number of uprounds after crisis actually increased, right? And this is something that the trend that we also keep track of it. I'll also show the data how during 2020 some of our finance investments were done. Right, so, you know, these are some of the investments that we have done, quite a few well-known names over here, but if we see overall today, I think what, when you choose, you know, a startup to invest, or let's say a platform to invest or a fund to invest, the question to ask is in, not in what great startup you have invested, the question is how have you got exit or how have the fall on rounds have happened. I think the proof is in the pudding. No money is, you know, it, it to be counted till the time. It's just on paper, it has to be in the account. Out of the total 100 plus investment that we have done uh, till June 2022, because after that also we have done about 40, 50 odd deals, but the money has just gone to the startup, right? It, it's just kind of getting deployed. Out of these 100 plus startups, the actual numbers are we have got exits or partial exits for our investor in as many as 28 of the startups. And that set us staggering average IRR of 195%, right? We have investors from our group already over here, some of the well-known names that I know at least. Uh, Deepak is here, Neeraj is here, Sanjay is here, right? And, and maybe, sorry if I'm missing out somebody, but these are the actual exit numbers with actual identifiable startups. So 28 startups is where we have given exits, uh, either full or partial exit, uh, average IRR of 195%. On top of that, 49 startups have gone on to secure next round of funding, right? For us, a next round of funding is only when a startup secures funding at an IRR about 25%, and exit is only exit when it secures exit at an IRR about 20%. That's our internal definition of exit and upround. 49 have actually achieved uprounds at an average IRR of 128%. Now that, out of 100, if I were to look at unique startups and all, that's a success ratio of almost 50%. And this, we are talking about an asset class where people say that, okay, it's like spray and pray, right? You, you invest out of FOMO, invest into 10, invest into 20. I think just by luck, do to chali jayega. Atra fail hoga, do chalega, do should kind of, you know, make you enough return on. That's not the way to do it. Idea is that through all this filtering process, as Vinay explained, evaluation and post-investment support, that's again very, very important, where you work alongside the founder and then these sort of returns are achieved. So some of the, uh, you know, high-performing one, Bharat Pay, Glam Plus, Geo IQ, Google, you know, all of them in 500% plus IRR actual returns. And then there are multiple others from ranging from 50% going up to 500% as well. Right. So I think just taking a step back, we spoke about various asset classes. Now this is again a data which we have taken on, on factual numbers, on actual facts, right? So if you see overall fixed deposit about 7% return, again, these are Indian rates of return. We spoke about returns over here and I heard answers from 0.4% going up to 5% now. Even if you were to take into Indian scenario, 7% FD returns, 8% in PPF, gold about 8%, right? 7.5% for real estate and listed equity over a bit of time, let's say 13%. The actual return on VCs, if you were to see USA IRR and India IRR, over a bit of three years, five years, 10 years, it is actually somewhere in the range of 20 to 31%. And these are, these are returns which are verified and these are absolute returns over a longer period of time, of course, right? So it's an, it's an activity which we need to do persistently and do it in a very active manner. Otherwise, this asset class definitely will outpace or, or outweigh any of the other investment asset classes as when I put from 6% to 26%. Right? And somebody asked a question, maybe I'll answer that now, is that why percent not come to 26%? And why not come So, because we are not patient enough to hold it for the time it needs to be held. So that is usually the issue uh, in not getting that 26% for all of us. And that happens to equity market also. While investing, it's expensive, hai, but let's buy because we'll hold it for the long term. Thomas market long term big gap. That is the time to buy more. Right? So we are not able to hold, we are so influenced by others. And human mind is made to act. It is not made to bore. 
and sitting on it is boring. And therefore we have the urge to do something. That's what is hard, right? The other point I want to make on this one is, any company you take today, top 10 by market capitalization. India, US, Singapore, Hong Kong, globally. Right? Take top 10 by market capitalization. Eight out of the 10, today, 10 years back, 20 years back, and 50 years back, will be run by first time management. Aap aaj US uthalo, Google, founders are still there. Apple, first, first management is running the show. Facebook, first management is running the show. Netflix, first management is running the show. Uh, pick more names, you will see the first great management. India, Reliance, first management is running the show. Then you have ICICI, then you have HDFC, then you have, you know, all of these, many of these guys being run by first management. Adani was there, again, first management, right? So what that means is that these entrepreneurs were not old. They were a startup not long before. They were started 20, 30 years back, or 10, 20 years back. So if you had invested in Infosys or Wipro or, or any of these, see the amount of the return you would have got, not 26%. You would have got 200% return. And these stocks were available to you when they went public. Infosys was available to us and it went public. How many of us held it so long? That is why we don't get these returns. So hopefully that answers uh, the question around why we don't get these returns because we are too motivated to act. I think it's the persistent investment pattern that one needs to follow. Just kind of taking personal example, uh, I was CFO with Ola from 2013 to 16. I started investing into startup around end of 2014 or beginning of 2015 when I made my first investment. It's been about eight years. Uh, Vinay and Ankur, they started also around the same time. Not while we were doing it independently, finally we put together IPV in 2018. So far we have invested in about 110 plus startups, each of us. Uh, but it's with this process and with this belief that every downturn we have tried and taken advantage of it. And that's why we'll have a lot of unicorns also in our portfolio. So overall at the end of the day it kind of stabilizes. If we see the IPV return today is 59%. The actual numbers when we take the exit percentages, when we take the exit IRR and when we take the follow down IRR. Plus the new startup that we have invested, we have just taken it at 1x. Right? So no depreciation, no depreciation. It's about 59%. And our portfolio returns will also be something similar over a longer period of time. And that's what I think kind of comes. Now this is one amazing example, thanks Vinay for bringing this up. So, Rakesh Jimjinwala, we all believe in his, we all believed in, uh, you know, late Sri Rakesh Jimjinwala's investment strategy, right? Sold Grisil shares in 2005 to buy a house, to buy a property. This is an example which he himself quoted, right? 27 crore. Now that 27 crore ultimately in 2015 from 2005 in 10 years, went up to 65 crore, right? In a city like Mumbai where the prices were rising, it went up to 65 crores. The same crystal share which he had sold actually were valued then at 600 crores. I think the power of compounding in equity, be it listed or unlisted, will always be much, much higher than any other asset class. And, you know, this is something this classic example proves for itself. I think one interesting trend that now we are seeing is that the most risk averse traditional global companies are also now actually taking interest and taking some very very active bets whether strategic or financial into a lot of these startups and some of the names that you'll see over here yahoo practically got saved because of their investment in alibaba right we all know about the yahoo story and all so not going into depth of it but some of these investments have really paid off well for them somebody like a unilever right a strong uh, FMCG conglomerate, they have also Unilever Ventures through that, they have taken a lot of multiple bets not only into FMCG sector, but something which is more strategic or aligned to their business like Khata Book. Microsoft has invested into Healthify Me, Tencent has multiple other investments apart from Flipkart and Swiggy and even Indian companies, when I spoke about InfoEdge, InfoEdge invested into Zomato and that have kind of multiplied the returns for them, uh, you know, in so much number of times. Razorpay into Shiprocket, Unacademy into Polygon, which is a blockchain uh, startup. So basically at IPV, without going into detail again, Vinay has explained the entire process, but for us, what is most important is obviously provide access to early stage capital to founder. Uh, we do from pre-seed stage, which is a check as low as 100k, going up to 1.5 million dollar. Our average investment ticket size works out to half a million dollar, but for right founders, we will start with as low as 100k and go up to 1.5 million dollar where we have invested in so many companies 
one plus million dollar checks as well. So capital obviously is more important, but more than capital, sorry, just check. Yeah. Investment process very important to keep the founder informed about what are the timelines involved. I think that's one of the biggest problem that Indian early stage ecosystem suffers from. Poor founders just go from door to door and have no clarity when the money will actually hit the bank and his plans go for a toss. Leadership access, business growth, mentorship, you know, with the with the support of investors, right, who are truly involved in not only selection process with us, but also in post-investment, you know, supporting to the founder. Uh, the mentorship is, is uh, invaluable. And finally, a startup friendly network that we are able to create with not only our investors, but also partners. So we have ecosystem partners across where we provide them debt facility, we provide them help with digital marketing, we provide with help with as simple as PR and IR as well. So it's the entire network that we have created that's useful. There's one more uh, point I wanted to kind of make here. Somebody asked about the, uh, active investing, right? So there are many people here in this room also who are not just investors on the platform, but they help us do the due diligence. They ask, help us ask all the questions that we listed out. There are 200 questions we have cover everybody on, right? More than 200. So people get engaged in their own area of expertise, allow us to solve for the problems that we think are unsolvable, and then also help us evaluate whether the founder is great or the business is great or can it succeed or not. Right? So actually every investor on a platform has his data on our CRM and the CRM suggests who can help. And by the way, while somebody asked for what is the membership charges, we are about 24,000 rupees. But every active investor takes back 50,000 back without investing a single rupee on the platform. So they can actually make a return even on the membership fee. Right? So that's the two pieces I wanted to answer here, like what are the charges. Of course we do charge about 2% per deal that a person invests in, uh, but then annual membership fee is there, which gets typically you know, taken back by being active uh, on the platform that system calculates. And uh, people help us evaluate deals, help us grow the businesses and help multiply their own values uh, of investments. So hopefully that answers these two uh, questions as well. In fact, one very interesting point around exit. So you know, Bharat Pay, we invested in the very first round and finally it turned Unicorn. At the time of Unicorn, then we decided to actually exit when well. it had already got the banking license. And within three months, actually it went up by another two and a half X. But we were very sure that we have got up to 80 X and now I think probably the time to exit. And as we all know, what finally happened or not. So, timely exit where we decide and we time it, that's very, very important, you know, in, in all the cases. Like we have all seen how large cap, uh, you know, startups also today struggle to kind of raise in the public market. So that's the cycle and that's why I think it's very, very important not to be just driven by FOMO, not to be just driven by the flow and time your exit also very, very well because ultimately it's money in the bank. And broadly the way to time the exit. Sawal hai ki aap time kaise karoge exit or how will you time when to exit, right? It's going from 2x to 4x to 8x to 10x to 20x to 30x and 80x in the case of Bharat And when we exit after that, no exit available, right? I think the things to look at when you invest are the same things to look at when you exit. Now that's a common drum. If you thought that the business is great, people want willing to pay it, it will go for 5-10 years. Is that the case at the time that you're evaluating for exit? The founder quality. The founder that you invested in, is he the same when you are exiting? If you think that his values have changed, or he's changed founder, he's got arrogant, he's got egoistic, he cannot handle the teams anymore, right? And there is hanky-panky happening, exit. Right? If you think the valuations are 10x, 20x, 30x or what they should be, they are no longer fair valuation. Exit. Right? So when we exited Bharat Pay, none of the stuff had come out. After 6 months, 1 year, the things that came out, came out. Right? So you need to know, uh, same 3 factors went to exit as well. So hopefully that helps you understand you know, the theory behind exits. So if Infosys is doing well and nothing is changing from why you invested, don't exit. Let it continue the run. Right, so that's the that's the piece on exits. So this is a quick snapshot of how IPV is structured and what all you know as a group, what all activities that we are up to. So inflection point venture, as we all spoke about, India's largest Indian investment platform with almost twelve thousand plus investors, eight thousand plus active investors on the platform. Uh, CXO Genie is how it all started. CXO Genie founded by Vinay, uh, you know India's largest CXO platform, and that's where we inherited our initial base of investor and that kind of still helps us 
to kind of drive the startups uh, with their uh, expert help also. Founders Genie helps founders at early stage to conceptualize idea to help them kind of build conviction around the idea and get them capital as well. Uh, Sachi Village is our joint venture with uh, Bearings, one of the uh, you know, most reputed uh, PE fund. Uh, with them, we, we, we work as a support system for early stage startups, specifically in, in, in deep tech space. Uh, First Port Capital is an extension of IPV. It's our angel investment AIF. So typically, a VC fund uh, will have blind pool fund where you invest into a VC fund, which is Fisis Capital I'm going to speak about. But VC fund is blind pool fund. First Port Capital is angel AIF where you commit as low as 25 lakh rupee. But this is a discretionary fund. So for this 25 lakh, you can invest into startups of your choice over a period of five years into whatever startups you like without having the compulsion of investing into each and every startup that the fund manager is proposing. Now this basically is an idea to consolidate our large investor base under one common roof which is the EIF and have best of the opportunities to invest as some of these you know, smart companies, smart founders, uh, uh, some great opportunities will not be able to accommodate so many individual investors on the cap table and that's where EIF kind of comes in handy. It's a, it's again the largest in the country in terms of the size. Uh, today it stands at 50 million dollar plus and it's an open-ended fund so you know, uh, with every startup that we invest into it, it keep multiplying. Fisis Capital, the idea is that while at IPV and First Port, uh, we do pre-seed stage to seed to pre-series A. Right, as I spoke about checks ranging from 100k to 1.5 million, 2 million. Now we have the unfair advantage or you know the right to win with knowing these startups early. Now when they are going for growth stage investment, right, so series A, series B, FISIS is an endeavor or a vehicle through which we will fund them for series A, series B as well. Of course with proper safeguards built in, valuation discovery will be done by an external VC only. Just because our internal IPV investing company, valuation discovery need not necessarily be done by us, right, while we continue to support it. And for more than 50% of the corpus, we'll look at leading the deals from the market also, you know, with certain preferred sectors like consumer tech, right, uh, deep tech, uh, and SaaS and others. So FISIS Capital is again a category two VC fund. It's a blind pool fund, as we all know, with a with a minimum commitment required as regulated by SEBI of one CR. Right? And uh, we will announce our first closure sometime very soon in Q1, and then start deployment of the fund as well. But with this, with this entire gamut, we are relevant to the startup founder if he does well from the very first check, you know, after friends and family round, from the seed stage or pre-seed stage, right up to series B, we'll be able to support him or we are already supporting him. Our strategy always is not to be a transactional banker. We will continue to work with the founder and create value by at least supporting him for next two or three rounds before we seek exit and at the same time give our investors also the option of partial exit whenever possible. If I may answer one or two more questions sure. on this page, uh, you know, people asked us dry powder lying around how do startups choose uh, which VC funds to go after, right? Uh, what does a startup need? It needs the ability and the help, technical capability, opening the doors. Who can help me sell more? Who can help me hire the right talent? Who can help me raise my next round, right? So people or VC funds who are able to do this and give a reasonable valuation. They will not go after the guy who is giving them best valuation. That's actually a trap. Because then you can't raise the next round because you are already overvalued. Right? So who can help them hire? Who can help them open uh, right markets? Who can guide them on what products to do? Who can help them build the leadership team? Who can help them raise the next round? Right? So if these four or five factors are available, then they look at okay, who is giving them better valuation than among all of these. So multiple filters that should be applied by the founders to, to attract the right so hopefully you know that answers this question and with FISIS again we get an additional unfair advantage and that makes us also geography agnostic. So we don't care where the startup great founders, great businesses come from at a reasonable valuation and that's why geography is not a criteria that we follow. Yeah. Next thing. Thanks. So I, I already spoke about FISIS. I think uh, this is our effort to leverage on the experience that we have had with early stage investment right, and taking it forward to apply the same rules. Of course, at late stage, uh, the fundamental principles remain the same, but with our expertise around operational matters as well, uh, we'll be able to kind of curate and support some of these finest startups, you know, having known them early on. And, and that's where I think the probability of generating or maximizing returns will be highest. Right? So we are, we are, we are currently open. We just got the SEBI approval. 
uh, with all the formalities completed about six months back, and uh, you know, fifty million dollar fund as approved by SEBI, we'll be looking to kind of achieve the first close and then go ahead. Uh, some of the numbers, as we all spoke about during the presentation, like, but you know, the way we have grown in last two years, a six x growth in investor base from twelve hundred plus to now about seven and a half thousand. Uh, investing members who have invested uh, ever to us uh, from 700 to about 2500 plus now and in fact growing every day. Uh, 140 startups that we have already invested into with another about 15 at various stages of investment right from evaluation to due diligence or to documentation. Right? And uh, average investment ticket size has gone on from about 300k to now about half a million dollar uh, per startup. Right, So while Almost 91 of our investments have been for a value less than 500k. Of course, given that we'll be looking at early stage as well, right? We have done 17 investments, which is by far the largest for an, uh, a, a platform which started as an angel platform now moving to a fund. 17 investments having value more than one million dollars, which is quite a sizable number. And the exit numbers and all I spoke about, which gives the overall return of 59. Great. So I think in terms of deal flow, well, these are the numbers, you know, so far about 8,000 plus funding requests evaluated. The current run rate, as we all call MRR in startup language, the current monthly run rate is every month you look at about 500 odd startups. And out of that 500 odd startups with the help of our selection panel made up of experts like you or our investing members itself, bring it down to about 50 where we, me, Vinay, Ankur, our core team, we meet them personally. And finally choose about 10 or 15 which presents you know, the founder pitch call as we call it, uh, to our investor base spread across 51 different countries. So on a Zoom call it happens. Finally, from the investor's feedback, we take it up for due diligence. And with that due diligence, finally we decide on investing or not investing. So finally, out of 500 startups that reach out to us for investment or we reach out to them through our outreach as well, we end up investing in about five startups every month. So that's the sort of success ratio that we have on the platform. And no wonder with this sort of a curation where it goes through at least five layers of filtering. Our, you know, performance is, is what it is uh, as shown already in the numbers. If I may add here again, there's one question on sourcing. How do we source them? It's an open sourcing decentralized platform, which means people like YC, people or founders can come and apply on our website. Second, people or investors, if they find a good founder or somebody reached out to them on LinkedIn or in person, they have a link in the app. They simply send them in through our system. And we have a policy of responding a yes or a no initially within 10 days to a founder. Every founder who writes to us or applies to us on the form gets a response from us within 10 days, whether we are moving ahead or we are not. Right? So that's that's the policy. We have no ghosting. Each and every founder gets it, which is about 5,000 in a year. Uh, right? So, so that's why the trust is there. Founders know they will get an answer. They know why they got a yes or a no. And therefore, you know, more and more the world travels uh, around. Great, so finally, summing up, you know, one entity, you know, driven around three pillars, uh, great business, great founders, fair valuation, four ACs framework, uh, portals, five forces following, right, seven tests of great founder group that we spoke about, eight tests of great businesses, finally all going towards 10x returns, right, and that's the North Star matrix for all of us at IPV, where we make sure that, you know, uh, the ultimate exit return for the investors should be, should be protected. Uh, and that's where we, we try and divert all our efforts and energy at. So that's about it. I think any further question investors have? So this may not be a nice question to ask. No, no, we you. love <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> questions on it. Take them on. But uh, we see that a lot of founders after a few years into the venture, right? Like I, I, uh, IPB. So there will be a point where founders will have not so, uh, they will become uncomfortable with each other and walk out. <laughs> so yeah. what happens in that scenario to the investors? <laughs> so as I said earlier that you know the biggest mistakes happen on evaluating the founders. Right. Uh, right. So the key is, and you know India had this system of matching the guns. Right, I don't know, uh, 36, 31, whatever, right. I think there was some science behind it, I don't know. But we have our system of matching that, right? So what we're trying to do is minimize those risks 
uh, but there were a couple that we just couldn't you know, find a good home for. So that these were the two on the timing side, right? The color timing aagya pata nahi. The other uh, one or two more examples I give you. For example, Rene we invested in very early. Uh, they were trying to build a SaaS product which could actually tell you, okay, which is my best selling SKU? You ask to Siri and Siri goes into your CRM, comes back saying, yesterday you sold this SKU the most. It was a fantastic product. If it comes up today, I'll still invest. But the problem was, the founder was not a technical engineer. So he really couldn't scale the product when customers started coming back with more questions, right? His technical capabilities limited him. So that's why we say that when you look at a founder, always look at whether he has the technical capability to scale to a large product, right? Others were not... We'll give you one more perspective, sorry. Yeah. So we invested in a company called Nikki, which was invested into by none other than Ratan Tata himself and Ronnie Skruvalo also. And these are just two large names that I'm talking about. There were a host of other super engines also on the platform. Uh, fantastic platform, you know, uh, AI assistant, which helps kind of uh, penetrate into tier two towns, you know, and help you solve, you know, for the consumer. Uh, you can order services, you can order products and all with the help of the DI. Uh, the guy just didn't monetize. He was so engrossed in penetration, penetration, couldn't keep track of his burn and always had this philosophy that okay, I think we should not reduce the valuation, we'll always be able to raise a large amount because I have all these super angels and large guys on my platform, right? And the board of directors also kind of kept giving him that thing that okay, let's not kind of compromise on valuation, we'll get the term sheet. Within one month, just one final realized that there is no further money left in the company to run. Right? And it had to kind of shut down because cash is cash, right? That's prime. Either you either you bring the burn down to zero and be self-sustainable or have realistic expectation on where the next round of money is going to come from and how are you going to build a sustainable business. Those were amazing lessons learned that doesn't matter who all you have as its investors. It's ultimately up to the founder how do they drive the business. And who do they listen to and who do they not listen to? We, said, we were telling them, you know, but cut your burn down, get more sustainable. But big investors on the board were saying, no, no, we'll get you the term sheet, don't worry. You just grow. Right? And, and that's what really kills the business. Uh, that Then you're you know, on a rocket ship, even a bird will hit, uh, will be a problem. So I can give you a few more examples. Out of seven, four we have covered. But they are great learnings for us as well. Yes, sir. Just a clarification. Earlier we were talking about uh, the IRR and what you can offer. Uh, did you mean rupee IRR or dollar IRR? Good question, sir. Mm -hmm. Sir, IRR mathematically is a sum of cash flows in no, and I cash flows out. We are investing in dollars into India. Will we get back a rupee return at today's exchange rate or a dollar return at the So we exchange rate? Pay, right now we are an India registered fund, so we calculate IRRs in rupees. So IRR within our control is this much. Currency risk is to yours. Yeah, yeah, currency risk is typically three and a half percent on an annualized basis against USD. That's what you will see last five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. Yes. Sir, you mentioned that uh, you get to know something wrong is happening in the startup. If you're a listed company, you know you can have an exit option. You can have an exit if something you think is wrong. But in a this kind of an investment, uh, you might get stuck. You know, even though you know something is happening, you know, you're not. So how do you guys manage to... So great question. I think I'll, uh, maybe I'll just take the example of Lehman Care when we were talking about the same failures as well. Uh, and I must also. take the example of some listed companies. Okay, please. Give him yeah, perspective yeah, let's start with that. Whether yeah. listed can be exited. Anybody invested in Bakarangi? Go <laughs> on. Yeah, I know. Anybody could exit? No, so, so no, if, you, if, you, if you know it, advance something wrong, then you can have an option to exit because it's something So that's a good question, Rish, but knowing but something much in advance is an insider trading information <laughs> in a publicly listed company. Right? <laughs> so the moment you know and you trade, you are in trouble legally. Right? Second is the moment the public knows the stock is down to like 60-70 percent, whether it was a yes bank, we saw it last week, DHFL, whether it was Adani. So the moment it's public news, it's gone. So public, public markets are not safe. Hai for a stock jitne hai, right? So, the risks are the same both places, right? Aap, aap ne plot, if you buy a plot of land, tomorrow you know the government is going to acquire it, that value is zero, right? So, so that's true whether it's real estate, whether it is public or listed stock, equity is equity. So that's the base principle 
here first to you know get on the common ground, and then maybe I'll let him answer. A few so then I'll also give a few more. We had invested into this company called Leben Care, which was into AI imaging, the uh, retina eye scanner. Now the guy raised uh, about two CR. This is about 2018. We just started 2019, and I'm talking about the guy raised two CR at you know 20 CR valuation. Showed some good initial promise and all. Try to make inroads and all, but then the market got very competitive. You know, medical equipment market and all. So he could not kind of dictate the price. He could not expand as much as he would like. Could not raise the next round also. And by the time we also realized that I think that is it's not a VCable idea, right? While the founder is great idea, it's not a VCable idea. Right? It, it can be done like a normal business, but not with VC capital. Now the beauty here is that the guy had developed a very good technology, a very good IP. And all. The valuation at that point in time when we had invested was 18 crores. But all we had invested was 2 CR. We went to Sun Pharma and told them, look, this is the team, this is the technology, is this something that is useful to you? He said, yes, definitely it's useful. I didn't have to make him acquire it at 20 CR. All we told him is that, okay, look, you acquire it for 3 CR, give our investors some IRR over the capital investment that they have made, and with the founder, you absorb them, give them some future stocks or anything else and all. So we win. And the deal actually happened. Right. So here the advantage is that I need to protect the capital investment that have been made into the company and not the total valuation of the company in case of failure. So, so if you have invested in the right product, right founding team and all, more often than not you will be able to salvage local. And this has happened at least five times with us. Whether it was Fixo, which went to Zomato, which is quoted or went to Huddle, Eleven Care went to Sun Pharma and so on and so forth. Now the difference between public and private is that here you have a liquidation preference clause, which means in case of a company going down, if the market valuation drops from an 18 crore to 3 crore, still you have a 50% IR. In a public market, 18 going to 3 crore, you have only 15% you know, capital back. So that's a huge so difference. So in every investor, you guys have to look back on the guys ensure they will be different. 99% yes. So there is liquidation preference, there is anti-dilution. For example, if we are investing into a company at 50 CR valuation, and for some reason, next round he has to raise at 25 CR. That in our case, our in principal investment value will get protected. So if we had 10% stake at 50 CR, at 25% our stake automatically will become 20%. Right. So all of these safeguards are very well taken care of in the founder. Exit clause, right? Some willful misconduct by founder. If founder is found to be doing or indulging in something wrong, we can invoke event of default and the money becomes payable easily. We can trigger the exit clause and all. Of course, all of this is on paper and our rights and on how far you can impose that's obviously time will tell but at the same time you know overall there is a proper mechanism around to track and enforce our legal rights also in this. Okay. And how the tax works for, for the other rights in this kind of So uh, if you are an NRI and you are invested in Indian startups or through a SEBI registered fund uh, it depends upon your residence status and how you are taxed on your investments. Right? So if there is a double taxation treaty, you get those uh, double taxation treaty benefits as well. Uh, and that is that is true for any Singaporean resident, let's say, investing anywhere across the world. So it's, 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 that's how simple or complex, whatever you call it, works. Uh, in India, uh, in unlisted equity, the long-term capital gain is applicable after two years, and short-term capital gain is less than two years of investing. So that's the broad taxation uh, principles. And I think there's one more question on the lock-in side and minimum investment. So minimum investment with IPD, people can start with one lakh rupees per start. And that was the whole purpose of democratizing investing for professionals. So this asset class was not available to professionals at all. And that's where we wanted to completely create a new market. Uh, right? Because it was not available at, as, as a market at all. And this is a very large base. Uh, and that's exactly what we created uh, over the last two years versus you have to put a 50 lakh or a 1 crore check to each startup and if that goes down, you will never be able to build a portfolio of 15 companies. Today we allow that to build a portfolio of 15 companies within let's say a pool of about 20-30 lakh rupees. Right, so, so that's, the, uh, that's the other difference. From a lock-in perspective, uh, every business needs 3 to 5 years to really build up a good business. Uh, but we are trained and designed to give exits as and when possible. Typically we give it within 2 to 3 years. Uh, but yeah, we ask the investors to be ready for about four to five years before uh, the exit comes through. Options are available to sell it to your friends or other members in the community, but that also occurs, uh, let's say once in a year kind of an opportunity that will come through. So when you say, sorry, when you say that you have to sell it, 
So for example, you are invest. You are saying the run rate is about five in companies in a invest in a month. Yeah. So if I as an investor have to go, either I choose one of those five. Say my kit is one lakh per month. Correct. I choose one of those five, or uh, is there a way that the five can come together and invest? In so it's a how the one to one tracking of the investment is. In mutual fund, we have NME. Correct. But I think you don't have NME, right? So Correct. how do you track one to one like in which I invest in one particular? Sure. And so how I choose that which one of those five are coming? Is there? Sure. You guys also add value advice maybe. Ah, where to invest uh, out of the pool. So, so first up, a uh, disclaimer, SEBI doesn't allow us to advise where to invest, right? I mean, that's an outlet. I just want to make sure that's clear. However, what we do is, because when we do a due diligence, we create a very detailed, quantitative, numerical report, which tells you what's the valuation, what's the multiple, etc., etc., comparatives, and it also tells you an overall score basis all the three parameters that we discussed in detail earlier, right? So that valuation report and that scorecard allows you to make a very good decision. Second, you are free to choose in one of the five, two of the five, five of the five, or zero out of the five. You can completely spend a whole year without investing in a single deal also. And if you think I that, yeah, I like think, to invest. Yeah. yeah. So which one of those five should I invest? Because that will all come. Yeah, that's a personal call. That's a personal call largely uh, because we don't really want you to invest because we advise you to invest somewhere, right? Uh, I think you need to be emotionally engaged and we have the ability to actively participate in the growth of that startup. If you think you can, I think that's the, that would be typically the right place. But you will realize that once you spend some time on the platform, mm. attend various calls, understand founder page, understand due diligence, you yourself will be in a much better position to gauge which one works for you, which one doesn't work for you. So you are uh, all the yeah, you get those three to five weeks. The, uh, you get three to five weeks to look at the proposal, give your input, work with us in due diligence also if you want. We'll open up everything, right? Uh, and then every Saturday we open only one team. Every Saturday 10 a.m. India time. Right? So that people have to decide on that day, on that Saturday whether you are going to open. Even after also, you can fill after the form. Saturday also it's open, open for a week. So you can decide then. So you yeah. have to be a member, which is the fee that you charge for your mm -hmm. discount. Is that what it was? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Like, investing. <laughs> I'll answer that also. Yeah, more on the macro front. Uh, we are seeing the word economics is changing uh, in, in a in a pattern now, and uh, the the free money won't be available from now onwards. This is what the general belief is. So, are you worried about the um, cash liquidity within the interested companies as of, as of now? Sure. Two, two parts to the answer. One, we always believe that money is scarce. We never believe that money is abundant. Why? Because our investing base is a salaried class people, our professionals like us, ourselves, right? And we know we get a, a certain amount of paycheck every month, which is very valuable to us. So, we say, Ekla Kupan Nikalna be mushkil. It was always the DNA saying every lakh rupee invested by a professional is valuable. Money is not going to be in abundant supply, so value it that way. It's not about our money, it's about the global money. See, when you are investing in a platform, you not alone are investing. Correct. He is, in the, is getting money across the board. Correct. Right? And when the liquidity is like, uh, uh, you, you know, the shrinking of the liquidity happens. Yeah. It happens to work. Absolutely. And the liquidity is the key key problem in these startups. Yeah. If you don't have a cash buffer, let's suppose somebody don't have a cash buffer for next six months or one year, and he's not expecting that. The, okay, from now onwards, the cost of the funds will also go up, and the liquidity will shrink up. Sure. So, how are you worried about those facts? Sure. We track those facts regularly. We may be worried about that in a few startups, but we are solving for it in two fine, two two ways. One. We have deep relationships with many of the VC funds, many of the private equity funds, and many of the businesses like Zomato and, and others, right? Where many of these companies actually went when they were liquidity crunch in, in COVID time, right? So that those relationships help our startups stay and not die, and therefore investors' money kind of gets saved. That's one way. The second is when the liquidity crunch is generally there, it's a great time for us to invest. Because our money comes from salaried class, which is a constant flow. That doesn't get impacted generally, right? See, but the return of your investor will depends on how much your your investee, the company you have invested in, will grow. Yes. And that will eventually depends on how the liquidity they will able to 
attain from the market because eventually they are growing companies. They are to yeah. grow by 3x, 5x. Yeah. And there are two complexes now. One is the recession complex, yeah. the growth is coming down, Correct. and the liquidity is also coming down. Correct. And the cost of the fund is going down. Correct. So how you how you balance those? Sure. Things? So cost of funding is not as critical from startup for directly. Indirectly it is because money moves from equity to debt because then the cost of funding goes up. Second, when you invest, you look at the runway that you are giving to the company. You should give at least two to two, two to two and a half years of runway for them to pass through any bad phase that occurs. Number three, when the runway is less than 12 months, we start working with them to raise the next round. Now, if the funding winter occurs for 24, 48 months for that startup, yes, we have a problem. But generally, if you are planned well, if you are disciplined about how you are making money, how you are burning money, etc., you can manage. The last resort is take a little bit dip, dip on the growth, but cut the burn down to zero and sustain. Also, to add to your question, you'll actually be surprised that there is no dearth of capital for good founders and good company even today. So while we may talk about macroeconomic indicators where liquidity is drying out and markets are in a turmoil, cost of funds increasing. On other hand, if you see some of these great startup, great founders and all are still able to raise capital. VCs are loaded with funds. So they have to deploy it. It's just that the criteria for selecting these startups have become more stringent and rightly so. That's how it should be. Valuations probably would have taken slightly a hit or would have softened. But it doesn't matter if you are in the long term there in the game. It's just a matter of uh, you know how much dilution you will do for a particular race. But otherwise capital have not dried down. Even we at early stage right now, we are not seeing any dearth of deals or any dearth of investor interest. Right? We have to in fact educate investors saying that okay, let's be very very selective and choosy about which startups that we are investing into and that's our responsibility. I think we are... Friends, we have in the interest of time, yeah, let uh, these books will be available. Okay, we take one last question. For today. Just like we talked about that at the point of when we can decide which startup we want to enter into, what about the exit? Is that something that you always take the call? Very good question. So, if you saw me presenting the exit slide, I use the word exit slash partial exits. Uh, out of 28 exits so far, 9 have been full exits and 19 partial exits. Partial exits are something which is like optional exit. So, we have an exit opportunity. We create an exit opportunity by bringing in a VC or a strategic player or, or somebody else. And we give our investors opportunity saying that, look, in this startup, there is an opportunity today to exit at 100% IRR, 50% IRR, whatever it is. Now you have to take a call whether you want to exit or not. Totally dependent on you. There is no compulsion. There are certain exits like when I spoke about Fitso. Now Fitso was getting acquired by Zomato. It's a lock stock barrel exit where founder himself is getting sold out or joining Zomato. There we have a rule that as 51% or more of the investor decide that okay we have to take full exit then everybody has to exit. Right? Under AIF also there are criteria where either everybody exits 100% or everybody exits 75% or everybody exits 50% but it has to be an exit where it is pro rata in proportion to your investment for everybody that's the same but it's a democratic process and we try and give power to the investor as long as it is possible with partial exits so you can choose basically even to exit on this platform can non-individual invest? yes we have, we have LLPs, we have private companies so then EIF as an investor, if you want to invest through EIF, the criteria is to have a 2CR network. If it is through a body corporate, which is LLP or part private or not, then the network criteria is 10 cr This is, I'm just talking about EIF, but yeah, directly on the cap table, depending on the construct, you know, any, any entity can invest. We can take more on the dinner table, I guess. Yes, yes, please. Friends, this folks will be around. We can catch up later. Thank you so much for such an energetic and an interactive session. A big round. IPB, continuing member of IPB, right? So hopefully if you are paying for being here, we are willing to cover your membership here. If just with one membership, if you take the IPB membership, we'll cover for your membership to this forum. Hopefully that's a good enough discount. If that works. Yeah, just, just a note on that so that you know we are clear in terms of expectations. The chapter is staying out of any proposal that IPV is making. So IPV's proposal to the members. Members have freedom to choose not to choose. Chapter yeah. is out. So that will be from an administrative program. That's right. I mean, we really want our members to you know get the best of everything. Just, just for administrative purposes. You'll be number one soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, many of the members uh, came late. Uh, we started this meeting uh, with celebrity note that our chapter has been awarded uh, second best chapter. Uh, uh, great leadership from Ramki and Somnath. Uh, maybe you can have a clap for them once again. Uh, before we go to our topic, uh, I'd like to share one thing. So I've been in this chapter actively involved from the committee side for the last uh, two to three years. I mean three years to exact. Uh, while we all see the awards and uh, the great work done, uh, one thing I really like to point out is the kind of process and systems, which was a focal point, uh, uh, started with uh, Pawan, Pawan is not there, but Ramki took it to our level. Uh, the day he took over, he was very clear that we are putting this process, systems, governance for a long term of the chapter. And uh, result is in front of us. We are growing, we are growing in leaps and bounds. And now we are demanding members who are saying, why not first? So, thank you Ranki for the leadership you have provided for all of us and uh, hopefully we will continue. <laughs> now for today's session. Uh, thank you Vinay and Mitesh. Uh, the quality of session is also gauged by the kind of participations which is given by the participants. So you agree that Saloni has to really take you down from the stage and keep the people quiet. So that tells a lot of us riveting sessions which we have today. So thank you for that. To summarize the session, uh, it was very practically oriented. Uh, we don't have to look on what was shown in the presentation. And I hope all of us take at least few of these points. And you are magnanimous when you said we have given you everything. Now it's for all of us to see what we can pick from that. So thank you for that. And it also shows the confidence in your own stuff. So with that, I hope uh, you will get a few members from Mars. And uh, as Sumna said, nothing from the chapter. Uh, as you said, everybody has to take their own decision. So. Uh, guys, they are there for another one hour around dinner table. Please pick their brains as much as you can. Thank you. So, some uh, orders from our committee members. Renewals. I Most of us have already renewed. Uh, Whoever is not yet renewed, please get in touch with Somnath or myself. Uh, we will help you to renew faster. And now we can go to IPV also. <laughs> There's something you can come to us directly or you come to IP groups. Come to us. But please renew. Second, what is it? Uh, so our next event is on uh, next Sunday. It's a family day event. Uh, Sanjay is not there. Vikas is there. Vikas is leading the show. Vikas, uh, you want to share something about the family day? Uh, maybe what's in the plan, Vikas? Yeah, come and share come, come, come. the plan. Come, come, come. Today we have got time. Thanks to our speaker, Sony. <laughs> <laughs> come. Hey, Anu is also there. Sorry, Anu. <laughs> so, uh, friends, we are planning a family day event on 12th, next Sunday. And we are still more, some seats left available. It's going to be a fun field event day. We'll have a lot of games and a great food. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, please note that uh, we have very limited seats left. Yes, seats left. So, if we get the registrations tonight, tomorrow we'll close. So, and we promise a fun and a fun packed e afternoon for everyone. Yes, and it is for family members and kids. And some of us who have family members traveling, you will come and join the families. So, it's for all of us. Looking forward to the evening. Thank you. Sorry? Uh, we also have some announcement regarding ATM. Yeah, just a formal announcement. We can uh, save the date for now. We are trying to schedule the EGM on the 10th of April. 
and uh, you will get notifications via email and everything. But for now, just save the date in your calendars, 10th of April. We're trying to do uh, a, a session plus the gym so that if you come here or whichever location we decide, so that you get some value in terms of you know knowledge of date and uh, professional development, and then the gym will be also held at the same time.